We all experience God at a profound level within. And the more you're controlled by the Spirit, the more your character changes. When you get in agreement together with God and with each other, you get answered prayer. Welcome to our next session on Ministering Spiritual Gifts. I, this is our last one. It's the place where uh, I believe we move to as we're used, as we're tuning into the Spirit. God changes us. We introduced this session with a uh, worship team. We call this unity in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit simply because real unity uh, doesn't mean that the individual uh, voices all become uh, you know, one or cloned or the instruments all become one. It's individual instruments, individual voices that tune in or that harmonize and make music. I believe that when you uh, touch the unity of the Spirit, that's when we make music together. That's when relationship reaches a, a level of fulfillment that goes beyond anything uh, that we can achieve by ourselves. That's where true fulfillment is. That's where unity of the Spirit is where when, we, when we're in step with the Spirit, that's where effective ministry can become, uh, comes a reality. That's where people experience God. That's where we can truly and authentically experience each other. And the fruit of the Spirit has to do with how it changes us, how, how we ourselves reflect uniquely the character of God. So let's pray together. Lord, I pray, fill us with your Spirit. Lord, teach this lesson, I pray. Lord, teach this insight. Let it be biblically based. Let it be, Lord, uh, an expression of your heart. Move on us, I pray, Holy Spirit. Fill us with your wonder, your presence. Teach us Jesus Christ. Show us the Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe there's a goal in relationship and ministry that is at the heart of what God wants for you and for His family. It's the unity in the Spirit. And it's uh, relating, doing ministry under the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Now, whenever people tune into the Spirit, relationships and ministry are maximized. There is nothing like tuning into the flow of the Spirit and receiving God's power to relate or His insights and gifting and ministry. I mean, there, there is nothing that energizes your inner being more than that. Um, now, we call this experience the presence of the Lord. Old-time old Pentecostals, uh, people, uh, people that, that, that wrote church history, they experienced this incredible presence of God. People who wrote the scriptures. And becoming people of presence is full circle from what happened in the garden, where Adam and Eve lost the presence of God when they chose to sin. That is, they lost the direct personal presence of God. I mean, what a, what, a, what a loss. I'm sure Adam must have grieved for hundreds of years about what he'd lost. Now, reclaiming God's presence is the goal of relational work and ministry to others. Ministry really is what Jesus Christ did, but it connects you, reconnects them to God. When you have, re have the restored presence of God, it provides the power to change and experience the life of God through each other. It's what church is all about. Jesus had this to say before his death and resurrection on the role of the Spirit and on the role on unity. John 16 says this, Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things. You're filled with grief, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. Now, that must have been then so important, and we've taught on this before, but I believe that it bears repetition. If, if, if Jesus Christ said, look, I need to go so you can, I can send you something better, the living presence of God within, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe me, 
or believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I've much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. I mean, there's the key to the voice of God. And, when, and, and he will tell you what is yet to come. See, we don't, we're, not, we're not left directionless. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. We get to experience Jesus Christ, His love, His heart through the Spirit. Now, it's good for you that I'm going away. It is of greater benefit to have the Spirit than the physical presence of Christ. That's a major statement. Think about it. This is the way that we all experience God. We all experience God at a profound level within. Had Jesus stayed physically with us, we'd have had to form lines. We'd have had, had to wait. But, but I tell you the truth. This is from the Father's perspective. Now, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say to you, or I tell you the truth, that means He's speaking and He's showing you how the Father looks at things. John chapter 5, verse 19 says, The Son can do nothing by Himself. We can do nothing without the presence of the Spirit. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. The role of the Spirit is to be with you and to be in you. John 14, verse 17. When He comes, the role of the Spirit is to convict of sin, that is, touch the heart and the conscience. It's to be your compass, your moral compass. He's to guide you from the inside. Convict with righteousness means reveal God's ways to you. Convict with judgment reveal, reveals the consequences of sin. And to guide you into all truth, it means you get to see life from God's perspective and you would get to see where God's taking you. Speak what He hears means that He's the voice of the Father within you, the still, gentle voice, the thought that sounds like your own thoughts, the thought that you can discriminate and, and, and know that the Father is with you. And he'll speak what is to come. That means the plans of the Father. You get, to, you get in on what the Father has planned for you and for others. And it glorifies Christ. It reveals the heart of Christ to people, to yourself and to the people you minister to. And it makes real what Christ has given the believer. So that's the role of the Spirit. Paul reinforces the Lord's teaching on the Spirit, on Spirit-led relational living and ministry when he says this in Galatians 5, 16 through 17. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. What a verse. Live by the Spirit. How do you do that? For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You're not under rules. You're under the motivation and the desire of the Spirit. So I say, live by the Spirit. You know, you do nothing without Him. You learn to, 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 uh, to follow your inner moral compass. You learn to listen to the Word of God. You learn to study your Bible and be taught by the Spirit out of the Word of God. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. There will be inner conflict for sure. I mean, new Christians are going to have inner conflicts, and you need to let them know that. But when you follow the Spirit, it will be contrary to your own natural ways, or unnatural ways, I say, because your ways are sinful ways. And there's going to be conflict, and you're going to have to learn to go with God and not with your stuff, so that you do not do what you want. Your will and desires must be surrendered to the Spirit and exchanged for His. This is a process, and it's necessary to stay in step with the Spirit for this to happen. Satan's against this kind of relationship. I mean, he, this is what Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. When Jesus said, I've come that they may have life, it's the Spirit-led life. It's life that's empowered by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about. Paul tells you how to con combat this in your life, that is, the, uh, the devil's work. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord, that is, in your relationship with God and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, then stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. Interesting passage. Be strong in the Lord means be strong in your relationship with God. The full armor of God means God's resources against the evil one, and the one who is all of God's resources is the Spirit of the living God. God wants you to resolve relational issues His way. Use His resources. Satan has a right to test you or to take advantage of you if you don't. I mean, even Jesus was, was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil in the desert. See, the, the devil's attacks solidify make you more confident as you, as, you're, as you pass these tests. Luke 22, 31. So it's not against flesh and blood. The ultimate problem is not your spouse or your fellow believer. It's the devil and his, his work against you. Spiritual forces of evil. Satan's forces are out to mess up your relationships and to nullify your ministry. When it says the belt of truth, that is, you need to learn to see the situation from God's perspective. I've given you that definition over and over again. The breastplate of righteousness means you have God's righteousness, not your own. You don't have to pretend or, or you don't have to defend yourself. The gospel of peace, you have God's presence. That is the Holy Spirit, the shield of faith. Uh, to trust in what God thinks of you protects you from the devil's lies. Uh, the shield of faith means your trust in God, you, to trust in what God has said. Helmet of salvation, relational and spiritual wholeness. You're not dealing with problems continually, but you're learning about, about who you are in Christ. It teaches you how to think straight, think straight about yourself. The sword of the Spirit, Scripture and the personal words given by the Spirit or energized by the Spirit is your sword against the enemy. Here's what Jesus did when he uh, was tested by the devil. He, Jesus answered, it is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Interesting revelation. It's not every word that has come. It's words that come from the mouth of God in the situation that you're in. And it says, then pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Use spirit-directed prayer to resolve conflicts in your relationship. Use spirit-directed prayer to deal with issues in ministry. That's what will make you victorious. Unity in the spirit. You know, I've never translated this whole idea to uh, relationship with my wife. What if the, the best way to, have, to, have, to become one with my wife what if the best way to become one in ministry with others is the unity of the Spirit? That when you follow the way of the Spirit, that when you submit your will to God, that automatically we'll become the family of God. I mean, it's that way in our families. I mean, when, when children submit their wills to the parents and follow directions, you have a, a unified home life. You have peace. Number one, unity in the spirit is based on, on the law of relationship. There's a, you know, there are, there are family rules that you follow, but there, there are laws of relationship that we've taught in previous seminars. And here's one in Matthew 18. It says, now again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by, your, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Now, I think that's, that's so intriguing. I mean, a blank check in ministry. But it isn't a blank check. It's really when you get in unity, when you get in agreement be together with God and with each other, you get answered prayer. I believe unity in the Spirit is the key to answered prayer. Now, prayers is really a simple exercise of seeking God's will. It's not so much bringing petitions to Him as prayer is fellowshipping with Him until you know the will of God. 
That's what prayer is. I'm so often bored in prayer meetings because all I hear is petitions from people and I hear so little on what God is speaking to us or to me or to the situation. I mean, I, I get excited when I get a word from God in a prayer meeting or when I hear a word from God in a prayer meeting. And so when God speaks to two, or uh, it's much more reliable than when God speaks to one. When there's, when there's unity in the Spirit and God brings the same word to three or four or five or to a whole bunch... I mean, you can see this, uh, for example, in Acts chapter 13. Uh, let me find it. Acts 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, while they were worshiping the Lord, uh, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, in other words, they're fasting to hear, hear uh, better from, the, from God. It says, the, and the Holy Spirit said. Now, they must have all heard the same thing. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. I mean, here's God speaking to a group of people in the church, and the whole group gets behind this because this is what the Spirit has said to everyone. Now, what if you would apply that to your relationships? What if you would apply that in our church body? What if you would apply that to, to how you're going to decorate the, the next Sunday school room? Or... You know, who's to be used in ministry here and who's to be used in ministry there and who God has called to ministry there. And, and, and uh, can you imagine what the church would look like or, or what your marriage or your relationships would look like where, where you, you get a sense? You know, I've just, I've just finished discipling uh, one, of, one fellow who came to me about 10 years ago, and he's starting to lay out his sense of direction and his sense of ministry. And, and you know, and I, and, I tried, and, and I encouraged him. I said, you know, this is what the Spirit of God is saying to you. And, and, you know, it needs to be a witness in my own heart. So I've been praying about this direction of ministry for him. Now, I've not gotten some witness in my heart that this is what God is, is doing for him. The witness I do get is there's going to be some rocky road ahead for this fellow. Now, I'm not so sure I want to tell him that right away. But I, I, it, it drives me to prayer for him. Now, it's the function of the Spirit to bring compliance to the Father's will and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is in everything that you do. Luke chapter 6 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do, don't do what I say? See, the test of relationship with God is obedience. That's just the way it is. Sure, you can say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's more like my wife, you know, she watches the movement. Oh, I love you, Deanne, I love you, Deanne, I, you know. And she's saying, I wonder if he's going to bring out the garbage. I wonder if he's going to pick up that vacuum and clean the floor. I wonder if he's going to let me sleep in because I worked till midnight last night. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? See, if you'll follow the way of the Spirit, you're going to do what God says. Jesus prays for unity in his last pastoral prayer. Here's what he said. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you who's listening to this video. That all of them may be what? One. How do you get to be one? When you follow the Spirit within. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. See, Jesus followed the Spirit so he was one with the Father. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know, let them also, let the world see that they're so connected with us. That, that they hear our message and they hear their message and it's one of the same. Can you imagine the credibility the church would have? I've given them the glory that you gave me. That is the Spirit of God within you. The glory of God is the presence of God, and the presence of God is the Spirit of God. That they may be uh, one as we are one. In the, uh, I and them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them just as you've loved me. I mean, what greater gift can God give you than the Spirit? This is the key to answered prayer and ministering God's way. There's a way to get there 
that involves learning to tune into the Spirit of God together. The Spirit works in several ways. He leads you to Christ. John 3 says this, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Born of the Spirit means that the Spirit has drawn you, the Spirit has brought you, the Spirit has given you birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The Spirit comes to live in you when you believe. He guarantees your salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. Now listen to that. You weren't included in Christ just because you were baptized as a baby. It says you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes after faith. And He's the deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. It's not the church that guarantees your inheritance. It's the Spirit within you until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit counsels you to do the will of God and resolves, and, and when you listen to the Spirit, He resolves your issues. John 13, 7 says He'll be the counselor within. He leads and empowers you to do the ministry of Christ uh, when you do the ministry of Christ to others. John 20, 21, again, that's verse where it says, and Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Now, if Jesus is going to send you without the Spirit, then he's not, you're not going to be sent the way He was. But if, he, if He's doing the sending, He's going to empower you to do you know, what He sent you to do. And so in verse 22, it said, And with that He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You can't go do ministry without the Spirit of God. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Do you notice that the Spirit within you gives you the authority to minister? Let's talk about the inner work of the Spirit. The Spirit becomes your relational capacity and ability to minister as you learn to synchronize your will and desires to His. Now, I'm going to make it very blunt, very, very plain the way I believe. I believe that when you minister God's will, it's the Spirit in you who does it. Scripture makes it real clear the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing, and whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Now, I believe it's exactly the same way. It's the Spirit in you. He brings all the sensitivity and relational capacity of God and puts it into the believer. It's Him. It's when you tune into Him, you get it. It's resident within Him. It's not resident within you. But as you resonate with Him, as you give in to Him, then it becomes you. You, you, you speak truth long enough and you become, a, you, you become one who, who speaks truth. If you practice listening to the Spirit, flowing with the Spirit enough, then you become gentle as the Spirit is gentle. He empowers the believer to minister, as Jesus did. As you submit yourself to the Spirit in ministry, you become a different person. Interacting with the Spirit in this way changes the heart, makes you a new creation. Galatians 5.22 says this, Now the fruit of the Spirit, see the fruit of submitting to the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And gentleness and self-control, against such there is no law. There is no accusation that the devil can bring on you when you tune in like that. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Let's talk about the first fruit, is agape. Agape love which is, which is unconditional, comes from the Spirit within you. You have the source of agape love within you. You don't learn how to do agape love. You learn to tap into the source of agape love. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. When you lay down your life for your brother, you're tuning into the sacrificial love of the Spirit within you. 
The second fruit of the Spirit is joy, which is the Spirit's response to the presence of the Lord. John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, was filled with the Spirit, and when Jesus came on the scene, when Mary came to visit her cousin, John responded, the baby in Elizabeth's womb responded to the presence of the Lord. So joy is the Spirit's response within you. Psalm 1611 says this, You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy. Notice, it's not, I was, you know, I became joyful. It says, you fill me with joy in your presence. Joy is the Spirit of God with eternal pleasures at your right hand. You resonate with the Spirit's pleasure. All right, the next fruit of the Spirit is peace. Now, peace is really the presence of God in you. It brings a response of security, safety, tranquility. Now you see, that those are all expressions of the Spirit within you. You tap into security. You tap into a sense of safety, of tranquility and peace. You know, the, the scripture that says, peace I leave with you. Well, is peace a person? Is peace some tangible thing? Uh, some... Um, you know, some salad dressing? No, peace is the Spirit of God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Are you catching on to this? It's the Spirit within you. Patience. Patience is the restraint of the Spirit which brings maturity. And it brings, brings you to the, to the place where God wants you to be. You grow up spiritually, so to speak. James says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces an expression of the Spirit, or patience. And let patience have its perfect work. Let the Spirit of patience have its perfect work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Notice, the only way you're perfect and complete, lacking nothing, is when you tune into the source of perfection and completeness. Kindness. Kindness is an expression of the Spirit showing up in positive, graceful thoughts and actions. Luke 6 says this, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because He is uh, kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Notice, it, it just simply authenticates who you are. Then you will be what? Sons of the Most High. After kindness comes goodness. Goodness, which means there, is no, there are no faults or selfish motives in the Spirit. See, when you tune in, when I tune into my own heart, there are selfish motives there. But when I tune into the Spirit of God, there are no unselfish motives there. You can be trusted. Romans 15, 14 says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge and competent to instruct. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the Spirit of God. You're full of the Spirit, you means you're full of goodness. Faithfulness, which means the Spirit of God will never, ever give up on you. He's always true to His Word. He's always true to the Father. 1 Corinthians 10 says this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Notice, when you tune into the Spirit, you can walk through the worst sin hole in the country and you will not be tempted. It's not your ability to not look. It's simply you keeping your eyes on the Spirit. How do you think Jesus did it in His day? Now, that's a lot different than if I have to use my own resources. Because my own resources, I'm going to end up short. Gentleness. Gentleness is the tenderness of the Spirit that you tune into. Which, and, and when you tune into that, you don't, you don't intimidate or you don't demand. I used to be known as the bull in a china cabinet. I still can do that sometime, but now I understand that when I do that, I'm not being Spirit-led. 
I'm not, and when I, and I, now I understand that I can tune into gentleness, not of my own, but I can tune into the gentleness of God. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, 29 through 30. You know, to take a yoke means to follow the teaching of, to be under, to be in the school of, and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. You know, I used, to, I used to have tapes of every Bible teacher I could get my hands on. I used to have 960 some tapes. Call me a tapeworm. Pretty soon, the more I listened to those tapes, the more I started sounding like those teachers on those tapes. And my wife would look at me strange. It's like I was some, somebody different. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd become different. I, all I was doing was listening to these tapes, and I was quoting the, the, the people that I was listening to. And I was starting to think like them, I was starting to sound like them, I was starting to act like them. Self-control. It's the Spirit's mastery of desires and passions. Romans 8, 6 says this, The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Remember the mind under the influence of the Spirit. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Wow, how clear is that? You see, the fruit of the Spirit authenticates your ministry. Who you become in ministry is more important to God than what you do in ministry. You know, you can do the things of God and Jesus Christ can say to you, I never knew you. Keeping in step with the Spirit will change your character. It'll change you. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says this, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only for your own interest, to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. How in the world are you going to do that unless you're controlled by the Spirit? And the more you're controlled by the Spirit, the more your character changes. And the more real you become. Real like Him. So, being controlled by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, in ministry, will change your character. A change in character requires that you have a relationship with Christ. Relationships are where you're challenged to change. See, it's as you walk with Christ, as you obey Jesus Christ through the ministry of the Spirit that you change. It requires, if you're going to do that, it requires fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, seeking His counsel. Friendship requires submission of your will and priorities. It requires an attitude of humility. James 4, 6 says this. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It requires unselfishness. It requires everything the Holy Spirit is. Without a character change, others will not believe you. Without a character change, ministry becomes ineffective. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, his work will be shown for what it is. See, every bit of work that you do for Christ will be tested, whether or not it's real. And as people get to know you, and it's, and, and it's simple performance, or it's simple, you know, you've, you've been under the influence of the Spirit, but it's not you, they will turn away from what you've done. They will turn away. Your work will not last. The sad part is it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't make it through to, to, to heaven. Conclusion. As the believer cooperates with the Spirit, as Christ did, he or she will change to become like Him. Ministry will flow unimpeded and undistorted. God will be glorified. The body of Christ will be blessed. The Spirit in you is the key to making music. God bless you. Uh, be sure now to do your exercise together. This is the last in this series. I pray that the Spirit of God will fill you, overcome you, bless you, and make you like Him.